Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Clay Armbrister, president of Johnson C. Smith University. And I'm Jennifer Appleby, president and chief creative officer of Ray Ward. Clay and I are so honored to serve as the co-chairs of the Charlotte Center City 2040 Vision Plan Initiative. And we'd like to thank all of you for your dedication and interest in the future of our community. It's been a difficult year for all of us. We understand that it's a challenge to think about the future, especially given our struggles with the tri-calamities of the pandemic, the economy, and the ongoing realities of systemic racism and injustice. But we are going to get through this crisis and we're going to address the inequities that have prevented us from being the best city we can be. Our center city isn't perfect, but as we continue this journey to build a better community, we should make sure that Charlotte is a city that is welcoming to all and that people from all cultures and backgrounds have an opportunity to thrive and to benefit from all the wonderful things our city has to offer. Center City, and especially our downtown, belongs to everyone. It's the place where we work, where we go out to dinner and a show, where we cheer on our favorite teams, where we gather to let our voices be heard, and where we make memories. I know it's hard to imagine what we'll be going through even six months from now, but today we're going to ask you to think about generations to come and continue this city building exercise to envision and create a blueprint for how we want our center city to grow over the next 20 years. That's why this plan is about providing a big picture shared vision for center city. Beginning back in 1966 and about every 10 years since then, our community has created a new downtown vision plan for growth and development. And these are living and breathing plans that don't simply sit on a shelf. They have helped guide us in revitalizing our neighborhoods and streets, designing public spaces like First Ward Park, Romer Bearden Park, and Little Sugar Creek Greenway, building our transit system with the Blue Line and Gold Line, establishing all of our incredible museums and theaters and cultural venues, as well as the ballpark and other sports facilities. These city building moves didn't just happen. They exist because our citizens and government and civic leaders and the private sector came together and worked together to make these ideas become a reality. Over the past two decades, a lot has changed in our community, and we are a different place than we were back then. Tens of thousands of new people, like myself, have made Charlotte their home, and they have brought new ideas and perspectives. We now have different priorities and challenges, such as equity and economic opportunity, which are issues that have become more obvious this past challenging year. During this planning process, we've gathered over a thousand ideas and comments by meeting with people throughout Mecklenburg County. Let's take a look at some of these ideas that we've heard. If I can distract, describe Charlotte in one word, I think it's awesome. Charlotte stands for collaboration, and I do think that's one thing that we do a great job of in more than other cities. We collaborate. It's never about what's good for the government official or for the neighborhood. What's, what's in the best interest of Charlotte? I feel like we're on a great path. Honestly, just continuing to, to keep growing how it is is enough to keep me. Charlotte's a city where you can still leave your mark on it. People who move here now can still have an impact on what it ultimately ends up looking like and can take pride in having their fingerprint on uh, what will be the future of Charlotte in a way that I don't think you can have in a lot of other top 20 cities in this country. I think 
that we as a community to plan for the future for Charlotte is to actually plan. We've got to sit down and figure out and reach out to the neighbors. What is it that you want to see? Whether it's a crosswalk, whether it's covered bus stops, whether it's facade improvements, and really get it documented and find out where specifically people want to see changes. Because with that, then we can start to tie capital dollars to projects to be able to deliver that. I think Charlotte would be um, a great place for my kids to grow up and um, become adults here if um, there are more types of jobs and more companies that move here. We have to really connect our city using public transportation. So if I had an unlimited budget and a magic wand, it would be transportation. We're going to have to transition uh, to more of a transit focus and less of a car oriented city. But that's going to mean uh, taller buildings. It's going to mean more dense neighborhoods. But it's also going to mean that you don't have to get in a car to go to a store. You don't have to get in a car uh, to go to your favorite bar or restaurant. Um, and I think it creates a better lifestyle ultimately. Um, Charlotte will be great if there's more um, diversity, as in more um, people from different um, nationality, different culture. You know, I think equity and in terms of housing, education, um, you know, all of those things that are part of, you know, being civic in a city. I would love to see Charlotte be able to support our young people in early childhood education as well as community college education because education is the key to success and transitioning from one transitioning one's life. If I could describe Charlotte in one word, it would be home. We can't wait to see what it's going to be like over the next 10 to 20 years. Clay, I just love the enthusiasm and passion and aspirations along with the optimism of the voices we just heard. It's so easy to get excited about the future of our center city when you think about the bold, ambitious strategies that have come from you, our community, and that will become part of this plan, such as how we can reimagine Tryon Street to become more animated and even more welcoming and better, how we can unlock all of the incredible possibilities in the amazing historic West End, your neighborhood. Absolutely. Or how we can continue to grow our regional economy in a way that benefits all Charlotteans. So now we'd like to ask Chris Bainan from our consultant team, MIG, to give you a preview of some of the big ideas we have in the plan. Chris? Thank you, Jennifer and Clay. Thank you uh, for a wonderful introduction and framing of uh, this plan and process and everything that's happening in, uh, in Center City, Charlotte and its surroundings. Uh, again, my name is Chris Bainan. I'm with a company called MIG. We are urban planners and designers and downtown strategists. And we are uh, just privileged and honored to be a part of this effort in working with you all the community members, the public sector, the private sector, neighborhood organizations, all kinds of folks from all walks of life who have been integral in uh, crafting this plan and this process um, to discuss. You all are here today and this plan is in process. This is draft ideas that we want your comments and feedback on today and uh, to help us uh, further improve the ideas uh, for this amazing city. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the program. I wanna go ahead and share my screen here and we will be off and running with the presentation. All right, for my colleagues here, I think I have thumbs up that everybody can see the screen. And I want to go ahead and just talk about today's agenda. Following this uh, welcome and overview, we want to talk about uh, uh, the community engagement, everything that's happened to date. And then we're going to go into a presentation that really talks about what has been crafted, what we call the vision plan framework. Ultimately, uh, we're going to pull out some of the big ideas and some of the recommendations. There are hundreds, uh, hundreds and hundreds of major ideas. We can't cover them all today, but we wanted to bring uh, a number of the recommendations and strategies forth uh, uh, for you all to consider today. And then ultimately have a, a community discussion and feedback session uh, actually peppered in throughout the day today. So 
as we work through the presentation, there are gonna be a couple places where we pause for discussion and to answer really as many questions as we can, given the limited uh, time we have here today. There are a few different ways you may be tuned with us, uh, tuned in with us today, either directly via Zoom, which hopefully a lot of people are on, it looks like there are, uh, viewing on Facebook Live, uh, or watching along on YouTube following this meeting. Please use the comment or chat functions uh, on whichever platform you're using to ask questions or make general comments. I have a few colleagues with me here today. I have uh, Ellie Fiore, project manager with our team on the project, as well as uh, Maria and Charles, who are uh, great contributors and partners from Center City uh, Partners, as well as Mark De La Torre with MIG. Importantly, I wanna underscore at this stage here with everybody here today, this is a team effort. There are lots of people from uh, the city and county or the city of Charlotte, the county of Mecklenburg, Charlotte Center City Partners, uh, our uh, consultant team members, neighboring concepts here in Charlotte, uh, who have all contributed to this uh, plan, the ideas, the presentation you see uh, coming forth here today. So Ellie, Maria, Charles, and Mark, they're all gonna be monitoring the chats. Uh, so please feel free to chat the entire time and, and the comment sections on each platform and then they'll tee up questions and comments as we move through the day. So uh, we'll go ahead and get into the presentation. We're gonna have a major kind of uh, middle point where we stop, take a breath, answer some questions, get some comments and feedback. We'll do a second half of the presentation and, and do the same thing. And then we'll be um, wrapping things up after that. We really appreciate your time today. We have two hours on our calendar. If we can uh, finish any earlier and get you on with your day, that would be great. However, there's a lot to uh, make sure we connect on. So uh, we appreciate you taking the time here. So what is the opportunity? The opportunity is great. And I think that uh, Clay and, uh, and Jennifer outlined a lot of it, but it really is the idea to create a vision uh, plan for 2040. It is a fresh start for a different city. Uh, and to deeply and authentically reflect on community priorities. We're gonna talk about that more in a minute. This is, as they described, an extension of, and really a legacy of great planning efforts in uh, the city of Charlotte for the center city planning. And this is a once in a generation opportunity for coordination and alignment. Um, if you were tuned into some of these effort, efforts, uh, there's a transportation planning initiative happening right now citywide. There's parks and recreation planning going on. There's the comprehensive plan that just came out in draft form that people were really excited about and gave a lot of input into. And then there's this center city plan as well as other efforts. All of these things are aligning to really chart the course of this community for the coming uh, 10, 20 years and beyond. From the beginning in uh, talking with you all, and talking as team members, we said, what are our guiding principles for this process? And, and we said, you know, and we heard, you gotta be bold and courageous. There's no time to, uh, you know, look down and, and think small. We should be thinking big. And I think there's a lot of big ideas that people have brought forth that we're capturing as a part of this process. Uh, putting people first, nearly every step of the way uh, in any idea that's come up, we turn to each other and say, how does this impact people? How does this contribute to the healthy lives and opportunities for everybody across the board in Charlotte? That was incredibly important here. And then you see some of the other ones, infusing equity into everything. We're gonna talk about that more. It's incredibly important given um, the awakening and reawakening we've had as a society around uh, racial uh, concerns, around social uh, injustice, all of the uh, strategies that you see here today are brought forth with that lens in mind, ensuring that we want to make sure that Center City is welcome to uh, everyone. It is a thriving place for everyone and lifts everybody up in a new future together. So beginning with our study area, it, this is not an uptown plan. This is a Center City plan. And you see the map here really extending about two miles outward from the crossroads of trade and Tryon, and you see some of the amazing historic communities uh, around in that periphery that all interrelate to this mosaic, really, of districts 
and neighborhoods that create a fabric that is truly unique in Center City Charlotte. And we've reached out and worked with all of these different uh, neighborhoods and, and representatives to ensure that they are a part of this plan and they feel that they are represented moving forward. Uh, you can see here just some of that uh, successful planning history going back to 1966. This is a regular cycle that has brought about real change, uh, whether it's new housing, whether it's uh, new offices that have you know, created the skyline over the past 50 years, or major infrastructure or entertainment venue improvements such as Bank of America Stadium. All, have, all of that has been a part of uh, these planning processes and the intent to craft a, a new downtown, an evolving downtown heading into the 21st century. And certainly there have been um, uh, you know, a number of things that you can see on this slide and many others that have happened, whether it's infrastructure, uh, transportation investments with light rail, recreation improvements, new parks, new stadiums, uh, new job centers, new places uh, and, and amenities for people throughout the community. All of that has led us here today to talk about the future. And that's exactly what people have done along the way uh, uh, is uh, our process of community engagement. You can see here, one of our ideas and strategies was to go where people are. And this is not just in Center City, this is throughout the county and the metro region. All of these are different events. Uh, I bet many of you have participated in one or more of these along the way. We have an engagement summary where you can go and access greater detail about all of the themes, all the di different ideas and input that we've heard. Um, that is on the website, allin2040.com. We encourage you to check it out. These are some of the events and spaces uh, that we've been a part of. And these are some of the words that we've heard. Um, from improved public transportation to affordable housing options. Very big, we're gonna talk about that more today. A very much a concern for the future. Uh, pedestrian only spaces, expanded business opportunities, uh, new spaces for culture and life and activity, homelessness assistance and outreach. A number of different things are all in consideration here. And this is all, again, uh, brought forth from the community. We also had a steering committee that helped us along, that has helped us along the way. You saw Clay and Jennifer in uh, the video at the beginning. Our co-chairs have been fantastic, as well as a broadly diverse 30-person steering committee uh, from residents across Charlotte. They have been instrumental in helping to shape and craft everything that you're seeing here today. And their representative of that broad swath of this increasingly diverse, multicultural, beautiful community. So importantly, we were on a bit of a track uh, this, this year to uh, deliver a plan earlier uh, than perhaps expected, or we were in the process. And then of course, um, you know, we had a, a big thing hit starting with the pandemic. And, and then soon thereafter, um, the, the passing, <laughs> pardon me, of George Floyd and many others in our society who have been greatly impacted. Sorry, I need a drink. <clears throat> as well as, uh, as the economic forces that are continuing to unfold in, uh, in our um, society today and impacting, of course, the Charlotte region. So we had a process where we thought, hey, we're going to be at our recommendations in the late spring. And we said, no, 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 no. We have to take all of this in and wrap things back around and go back to our ideas and opportunities at the core. Make sure that we are really getting this right, rounding back to community members across the board, ensuring that the vision holds, re-engaging with them, and then ultimately crafting what you see here today, reinforcing and infusing more of these ideas and, and responses with respect to the pandemic, with respect to, uh, to the racial inequity concerns that we have in our country and in our city. And now coming forth with all of that lens in our project. So you can see here, uh, we had a number of uh, discussions then over the summer and the fall, uh, neighborhood focus groups, broad representation, and ultimately, uh, just a, a real great showing from 
the community that, that uh, you are a part of and that people have expressed such love for. As I mentioned, we have come up with 200 plus major recommendations as well as many, many more uh, sub recommendations there, all related to policies, projects, programs, implementation measures we can do in the coming years to bring about the vision for the future. That does relate to short-term economic recovery. We know we face some very acute things right now, but we're keeping our eye on medium and long-term, the bigger ideas or the longer-term ideas. So it's this mix of these top priorities, bigger things, as well as uh, quick wins that we can have. Now, importantly, uh, all of this shakes out into what we call the plan framework. And the plan framework is important in that it allows us to categorize and, and put together all of these strategies and actions into an actual plan document. We don't have that plan document yet. This is the way to start to categorize and work with you all and get your input to make sure we're going down the right path. But we have a series of vision elements that we will talk about soon. These are the highest level values that we hold. What do we want to achieve as a community? Then there's a series of goals um, that help support those vision elements and start to categorize specific actions, strategies, and implementation measures. <clears throat> Finally, there's a set of focus areas where there, uh, where there are a number of physical strategies, investment strategies, a private development or public infrastructure, things where uh, we can start to make changes in the urban environment or improvements in the urban environment that support our goals, that ensure that we are uh, thriving and inclusive, memorable, resilient, sustainable, and loved as a uh, community and, and as a center city moving forward. So these are the places where some of these things take shape and we'll be talking more about that today. At the highest level, I want to underscore that lens of inclusivity and equitable growth and change. It can definitely be said that um, you know over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of growth that has occurred in Center City Charlotte and perhaps its greatest growth period since its inception as a city. But not all of that growth has been across the board and helped people uh, it, it all be able to share and participate in that equity and, and growth. That is a key lens we're putting to everything in this framework that you'll see here today. We do also want to understand and learn from the pandemic that really nobody saw coming or very few people did and understanding how things can take a left term and turn and we need to be flexible and nimble. There are gonna be a lot of uh, very direct strategies in this plan, but we also need to uh, build in processes to interrogate in six months, a year, two years, five years. Are we on track? Are these strategies still working for us? Has a new thing happened in the world or locally? that impacts us. All of that is a part of our, uh, of our plan approach. And then, as I mentioned, this is not a plan to sit on a shelf and that has not been uh, the legacy for decades with each of the plans we talked about. Action orientation equaling real change in the future uh, for all uh, part who participate in this center city is the highest level uh, direction of this plan. All right, so I realize uh, we're covering a lot here. I'm gonna continue to cover a fair bit of information and I'm also gonna check and make sure my team members here are, uh, they're sending some chats here. Um, all right, I think we are all good moving forward. They're just saying, hey, keep rolling here. And, um, and so I'm gonna go through uh, some big ideas and recommendations for just a little bit more here in the presentation maybe uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so. And then we're gonna pause and have that interactive session. Then we'll do the second part of the presentation and discussion. Oops, there we go. All right, I mentioned those vision elements and we're, that's how the, uh, the presentation is formatted here today. And we're gonna start with the first one, which is thriving. And thriving really relates to um, how prosperous we are how many uh, jobs or commercial development or retail opportunities are there? How do we help small businesses? How do we grow a talent pipeline? All of those things are a part of ensuring that this growth that we do foresee coming is shaped in a way that benefits all across the board. So 
we have an economist on our team called Economic and Planning Systems, and they have done a, a lot of research for us and understanding that we have been uh, capturing in Center City a healthy share of jobs, both growing locally as well as importing new jobs, but we need more housing. I think that comes as no surprise uh, to you all. The, along with all of this is a growing cost of living, uh, but there are places that we'll talk about here today, and many are in those focus areas, where we can, we can focus some of that growth and shape it in a way uh, that is importantly uh, responds to or anticipates and deflects those growth pressures and displacement um, possibilities that we want to stave off in the North and West End neighborhoods in particular and other places. So over the next 20 years, uh, you can see some of the numbers here in 2020 and the big growth that's happening is projected in the, in the uh, coming uh, 15 to 20 years that we will see a 65% increase in jobs and a 92% increase in households, where in 2040, we had 64,000 households, uh, nearly doubling what we have here today in 2020. And then uh, obviously, of course, that relates to uh, the number of residents in Center City. All of this uh, it brings about change that we need to anticipate and shape to ensure that it helps us achieve our vision and goals. So we need to harness this growth and continue to be a desirable place for people and businesses to locate. Importantly, and we'll talk about this in a moment, uh, creating a greater diver diversity and mixture of employment opportunities. I think a lot have, um, you know, over the past decades, a lot of the job growth and support in the economy has been from the financial services sector. There's disruption happening there. There's disruption happening across the board. Focusing on a diversity and mix of employment opportunities helps create a more resilient economy. So all of these things are, uh, are, are moves we need to make to ensure that there's greater vibrancy and that there are more opportunities for people to participate in that economy. And we're seeing headlines across the country. You know, is this the end of uh, cities and downtowns because people are gonna be uh, flocking to the suburbs because of the pandemic? We don't see that as a complete uh, reversal happening. We believe that, and our research shows that there is going to continue to be um, a center of jobs and growth here in the region, in Center City, and we need to continue to bolster and shape and harness that. There are a number of strategies that we will be talking about further with you all. Um, related to commercial and residential affordability, the diversity of employment types and sectors, as I talked about, uh, you know, adding hotel rooms. That's something that isn't always on everybody's minds, but we could see a doubling, a need and doubling for hotel rooms. That's not just uh, related to, you know, that, that hotel room or the hotel uh, owner. Jobs in those industries and the supportive industries by people coming into town, staying at hotels, jobs that are in those hotels or in the restaurants where people go down the street or the convention center. All of these things are in the ecosystem of the economy that we want to make sure we have our eyes on and have specific strategies to help us uh, manage that growth in the ways that benefit everybody. And, you know, we've been talking with folks and in many ways, um, you know, the growth has been or the comparatives have been, hey, you know, Nashville, Austin, these places are, are what we're, you know, are comparative peer cities. But with the growth numbers we're looking at and the trajectory we're seeing, you know, thinking along the lines of 20 years from now, Charlotte being more in the realm of a Boston or an Atlanta or a Dallas, that's the sort of growth and sort of change we're potentially looking at. So there's a lot in front of us that I think can be, um, you know, scary prospects. At the same time, I think it can be really helpful prospects if we make sure that it is equitable and inclusive and we provide opportunities for everyone in the community. So on this kind of thriving front, creating a thriving center city with a strong economy and a place of innovation and big ideas. And so I'm gonna to get to in, into some of the more uh, specific strategies now. I talked about the diversity of industries, sectors and jobs. We're gonna have specific strategies here that focus on whether it's tech or, or healthcare and medical services, construction jobs, 
uh, new making of things, industrial manufacturing, there's all kinds of service sectors, things that can be continuing to happen to diversify the economy. And really thinking of Center City as uh, a hub of innovation, creating that ecosystem and uh, talent pipeline, if you will, in each of the areas that you see here. These are some of the um, uh, focus areas that we have. And you'll notice, importantly, these focus areas uh, leverage existing infrastructure, such as the gold and the blue line, as well as this purple dash line, which is the future silver line. We want to make sure that uh, those opportunities come forth and we talk about our economy in ways uh, that work with the neighborhoods and surrounding districts and leverage this infrastructure to create a greater whole. You'll notice this is not an uptown plan where all of the ideas and thoughts and, and change are within the loop here. It extends, builds across and connects across the loop and, and, and works with those other center city neighborhoods, such as the North End. This is an area that's been talked about for many, many years now, historic uh, uh, neighborhoods such as Lockwood, such as Tryon Hills. And there's change up there with the, the Blue Line stations that have come forth. And there's innovation that's been happening. Camp North End, other, uh, the Duke Energy uh, facilities. There's things that's happening in, if you will, kind of a, a funkier, different prototyping, uh, imaginative format. We think there's opportunity for things such as uh, technology and sustainability uh, campuses or facilities that really relate to what are the new uh, energy and technology and uh, um, sources of economy and jobs for the future, or perhaps a, a medical school opportunity. You may have heard that this is an idea that's out there. And the idea being that uh, the medical school of today is not one that is a, um, uh, you know, something that we put a hospital on the hill that's kind of warden, cordoned off. A hospital and medical school opportunity of today is one that really feeds that talent recruitment and retention pipeline and focuses on research and, and innovation and is an economic engine, not just for that entity, but for uh, people from throughout the community. So, you know, what might that start to look like? I want to emphasize, this is not a plan. This is not an architectural drawing. This is not in a specific place. This is the concept of what are the key elements of an integrated neighborhood to bring about a medical school. And the idea being that this is not just about a hospital or medical related services, but all of these different things could start to be a part of it. Classrooms and labs, research labs, medical workforce housing. So that if you're working in this area, uh, you have a very short commute and you have uh, you know, housing that works for you and your price point, there are, or your income level rather. This whole idea is not just about uh, you know, high priced uh, or high income medical administrative or doctor jobs. There are all kinds of pipeline opportunities in nursing and tech and other areas uh, that can be a part of an integrated campus like this. And you can see there might be visitor and extended housing for people who come to uh, be with their loved ones or you know, new technologies such as AV shuttles and connectors to the light rail system or medical student housing or other offices and retail. All of this is the thinking of a, a medical school opportunity. We need to be uh, really thinking big ideas here uh, and new funding tools and streams. There are uh, tax increment ideas and other things that we can start to look at where we can really um, you know, leverage our collective force as an economy and take portions of that to specifically target inclusive economic development, housing for homeless residents, uh, child care and support services, all kinds of things are possible. We're exploring those funding mechanisms for the future. All of this, importantly, to have a thriving economy must be rooted in inclusivity. And we've talked about that a little bit here today. And it's important to process, understand, and take action on the events of this year, the events of the past several years and decades and hundreds of years, and bring forth real opportunity and real uh, change for the African-American community, as well as the um, people of uh, color throughout the area. And so 
we have a number of things such as funding models for uh, commercial spaces, uh, particularly targeted for uh, minority and women owned businesses, access to capital. Oftentimes uh, great entrepreneurs have an idea, but they have not had traditionally had access to the banking system. So micro entrepreneur lending pools, neighborhood real estate investment trusts, all of these are specific strategies we are putting into the plan. And of course, this is not just about the future. These things are happening now. A great example being uh, Charlotte Center City Partners Small Business Innovation Fund. So this year, in response to the pandemic, uh, there, this initiative uh, sprang forth. And it's really designed to spur innovation and adaptation of small uh, storefront businesses. Um, they, they are the ones, as we know, have been so impacted by this crisis. You can see uh, the sorts of money that's been put into that. And the vast majority of grantees are minority women or veteran owned businesses. So putting our money where our mouth is as a community with real dollars, real things that ensure that we're taking care of our own. Other ideas for the future include uh, an entrepreneurial acceler accelerator program and, and resource. Maybe this is a specific physical hub where ideas can be generated and acted upon and business plans can germinate specifically for people of color. We wanna put that forth here in this community. We also wanna make sure that we are uh, doing talent development and training programs like this great uh, youth force high school education in New Orleans, uh, where students are trained with real life, real world skills, connecting with people in the business community or in the public sector and looking at those career opportunities as a pipeline from high school so they can grow and learn and create true generational uh, change in their communities. We know that uh, so many people have been impacted this year by affordable and accessible daycare or lack thereof. Um, we know that uh, it's been hard for parents to uh, you know, be able to respond to this environment where uh, you know, they need to work their child needs to be on school, uh, Zoom, and all of this, even irrespective of the COVID pandemic, all of this needs to be more strongly a part of our future so that people can have accessible daycare, uh, either physically or money or um, affordability wise, and they can make that work in their lives proximal to their job opportunities as they grow. Now related to all this and incredibly important is the story that we all know about um, the, the uh, incredible scar on the history of this community. And I'm talking specifically in this case about, um, about Brooklyn and the Brooklyn neighborhood that was torn down and decimated uh, this historic African American community during urban renewal times. And uh, you know, here we are 60 years later and a promise was made hey, we're, we're going to build you a high school. We know we're moving you out of here in the name of progress, which we know is, uh, is, um, was incredibly, you know, the wrong move at the time. Uh, but we have not fulfilled that promise. A high school has not been created in the second ward. And so now, and this is not a new idea. In fact, many of these ideas are not necessarily new. It's about bringing them all together in, uh, in this plan to bring them forth holistically and they all work together to create a brighter future. But this was in the 2020 plan. This is in the plan before that. Now is the time to create a second ward high school. But importantly, doing it in a way, and you know, there is um, ownership by the school district in the second ward area. There's a developer proposal that's, that's been in play in the second ward area. This is, not what we're seeing as maybe just one uh, building, but maybe it is a whole kind of campus environment where its unique curriculum addresses economic mobility and career pathways and really aligns with what's happening right there next door in Uptown and along Tryon Street so that we have direct pathways for education, for internships, for um, business leaders who might come and select or you know work with talent or or, um, or, or teach classes, all of this in what we would say is, a, is an, you know, um, an urban environment and a campus right here in the second ward in Center City. So again, 
This is not located in any one spot, just like the medical school opportunity, but it's the idea that we, we would create together a, a campus environment that allows for student growth and uh, classrooms and athletic facilities and, and uh, you know, a, a green environment where kids can learn or children or teenagers rather can learn about um, you know, sustainability or ecology or any number, urban planning, any number of things uh, really as a, a preparation for the workforce, preparation for higher education beyond high school. One idea is also, as you see here on the right here, just the idea conceptually of student housing. We may have some students in the community who, who uh, their circumstances, it would be better for them to uh, be in uh, you know, almost a college-like setting, living on campus here and attending uh, classes. It's a, it's a really big idea that's been around for a while. We are accelerating it now and making it an absolute priority as a part of this plan. And again, this could be um, uh, maybe a partial magnet school where uh, if you live in Uptown, maybe you're in the first ward, uh, you, this is your high school, but it also could attract students from throughout the community. Finally, here in this portion, I'll talk briefly about memorable and a memorable city and a destination um, for the community. We've heard this a lot, you know, we have made investments over the last uh, decades that have created places and experiences of culture, connection, destination. These are the things that, as, um, whether it's a new performing arts venue or a new park space or program and activities, these are the things that create civic pride and, and things that are memorable, not just for people in our community, but from throughout the region, the state, the country, and internationally. Remember, we talked a little bit ago, people expressed, you know, we don't want to just be, you know, second banana to Atlanta or one of the great cities of the Southeast. We want to be one of the premier cities in the country. And part of that is creating a memorable destination. And as I've said, we've done so many things with respect to uh, parks and open spaces and programs and activities. One of the ideas is to look at Tryon Street in a stronger way way and this is one of our focus areas and this was a street that certainly is identifiable uh, right now and um, you know a place for uh, center city folks to gather to work to shop um, however we have also heard that this this spine through uptown is not necessarily welcoming for everybody a lot of people do not see this as the place where they are welcome or should be and it was designed uh, you know, 30 plus years ago. Now is the time, people said, to make it a place of comfort, of intimacy, to reflect more of our, diver our diverse culture. Can we bring more life and energy and art and places to gather and, and have music and places to roam? When we think about the great streets of the world, that's what Tryon should take the next step to, to move into. So as we look here, we see, uh, here we are on Tryon Street, uh, looking northeast between 4th and Trade. And we're gonna have several visual visualizations like this that show here's the existing condition. And you can see, um, you know, it, it, there are certain things that work to a certain degree. And many of us have walked along Tryon Street and, you know, there's a tree canopy and, and there's a, a wide sidewalk, but a lot of the environment is given up to, to automobiles. Uh, you know, so there are some big blank walls and ground floor spaces that don't necessarily, you know, relate to or activate the street as well as they could. Well, we heard from people, we think this should be a more pedestrian oriented place. Our city should foster more bicycling and walking and street level activity. And, you know, it's one of the things we've learned uh, through COVID. One of the ways to activate further the streets is to have uh, you know, outdoor dining where we can socially distance to have what we call parklet spaces and more opportunities for people to arrive by, um, by uh, mode other than the automobile, whether it's by bicycle, by scooter, by transit. So you can see some of the potential changes that could happen here. And you see a more activating and welcome environment with more outdoor dining and activity. And importantly, the opportunity to think of this space in uh, flexible terms that, you know, do we need to always have a place where cars can go down? And certainly curbside management, deliveries, things like that are, are, are 
quite important and, and we believe the automobile has a role, um, but does it need to take all of, up all of this space all the time? And sometimes does it not need to take up any space and we can create uh, a warmth and an environment like people have expressed to create uh, you know, art and activities and attract people to the uptown core. So this is just a, a high level concept. Importantly, uh, there would be as a, as a direct uh, strategy out of this plan, uh, an action point would be to create a comprehensive street date, streetscape design project. We need more community engagement around that. We need to make sure that this place reflects the multicultural corridor that today comprises Charlotte and, and not, uh, you know, and moving forward from its uh, original inception and design. And I know that um, pilot programming and testing has been done this summer. We're gonna learn from that more and build that toward a different future for Tryon. Another street in the Uptown Core that can uh, be, you know, a place that's memorable is Brevard Street. And you see here, we're looking uh, north eastward toward the Spectrum, uh, center and uh, we have the, the uh, bus facility here, the transit center here. We have some historic uh, architecture, but this street segment really has not been active as, as a great street in Charlotte. We think there's opportunity. The convention center is behind us. What if we can start to look at this and moving it toward this? There's great opportunity for transit oriented development that would linked to that bus and light rail station that is right next door. The opportunity for African-American and minority owned businesses, uh, some of those incubators maybe can take place and shop in here. Maybe, uh, you know, we close this down when the Hornets uh, win the NBA championship with LaMelo Ball uh, leading the way, uh, who knows? Uh, but this street could be sports, entertainment, life, activity, mixed use, a lot of ideas that the community has, has brought forth here. All right, so I uh, realize that's a lot to throw at you and um, I, I've been talking quickly, but we're very excited about the ideas and we're very excited to hear your thoughts on uh, these th first three vision elements. So I'm going to um, work with the team here, take a pause, probably take a drink of water here too. and. Um, Let's see here. I'm going to see if we have some comments coming in. So uh, maybe um, Charles, Mark, Maria, and Ellie, if you want to go ahead and uh, take yourselves off mute and uh, let me hear what some folks are saying so far. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so uh, I think it's important to start here. You mentioned earlier that there, there are a lot of plans going on in Charlotte right now. Right, you mentioned that this is a once in a generational opportunity for alignment. And so could you talk a little bit about where the 2040 Center City Vision Plan aligns with the comprehensive plan at the city of Charlotte and, and also where this plan aligns with other plans going on right now? Yeah, it's a great question. And so um, it aligns at a conceptual level and it aligns at a very you know, specific kind of um, tangible level. So uh, for everybody's benefit, the comprehensive plan is the guiding force and policy direction, I think um, many of you know, for the entire city. And it speaks to uh, the breadth of things, whether it's sustainability or, um, or open spaces or mobility or growth and change in economy, uh, climate change, number of different things are all a part of that, um, that planning process. That's the umbrella document. The other documents need to uh, take its cues from and, and nest within that. And fortunately, what's happening right now is there's this concurrent process where the center city plan is just behind the, um, the comprehensive plan. And uh, from the beginning, we worked to coordinate those schedules. And, and uh, you know, fortunately so, our same firm, uh, MIG, is leading as the prime consultant, uh, the center city, or I'm sorry, the comprehensive plan document. So we have been in lockstep the whole way to understand uh, the milestones along the way to gather community engagement that we're sharing back and forth. It's been amazing. We've gotten so much input into the center city plan 
because we've been able to leverage and collect what people are saying throughout the community through all of those uh, engagement opportunities and, and specific events with the comprehensive plan. So we have been um, coordinating with the comprehensive plan along the way and taking our cues, ensuring that we're using uh, you know, similar language that is the, is the same as what's in the comprehensive plan and reflecting those values. When we talk about um, equity, inclusivity, places for all, all of that is, is starting at the comprehensive plan level. And this project is further reinforcing that. Perfect. And, and I, I want to follow up with that because we got a great question from uh, Maddie in the, in the chat. So uh, of the additional plans, there's currently a, a tree canopy action plan, as you know. Um, so how can we avoid the, the idea of the cement city or city that's warming up? I'd love for you to speak to that a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a great one and actually very uh, near to my heart. When I moved into my neighborhood, uh, we noticed that uh, that there were very few trees along the street. And within the first year, we worked with the city, my community, uh, and the neighbors to uh, plant in one day 36 trees all along this row that now are, I don't know, 30 plus feet high. And it's very, and you see the, um, the very important uh, impacts of that with respect to uh, shade and comfort and habitat and the very real thing that um, if I'm in center city, I'm walking along one of the streets and if it is, um, if the traffic is calm, if I have a buffer between the road, if I have greenery around me, if I have shade and tree canopy, I am much more likely to walk from destination to destination and feel safe and comfortable if I don't have uh, those elements of, you know, what, what was described as a cement city. So um, yeah, specific strategies in this uh, plan to support the tree canopy plan. And, and you'll see that, um, you know, we want in, in each of our, uh, you know, whether it's redesign of a corridor or creating neighborhoods that have the full breadth of amenities where we're, we'll talk about this in a minute where, you know, uh, we don't have an ATM, we don't have a pharmacy, we, we, we don't have a, a, a market for us. And we don't have a tree canopy that those other nicer quote unquote neighborhoods have. We deserve that too. And so uh, that sort of beauty and sense of connection to the environment, we're taking very seriously. I think it's a great comment. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, we have another great question from Tiffany. She's knowing that we really can't talk about growth without being really honest about the reality of affordability and gentrification challenges throughout all of Charlotte. So how are we approaching in this plan and addressing affordable housing? Yeah, that's a great question. And in a few minutes, I'll be uh, showing some slides where we talk specifically about that with specific strategies with respect to um, uh, funding of affordable housing and uh, policies related to affordable housing. You know, it is, um, housing is a, a crisis in many places around the country and there's no silver bullet. You have to attack it from many different angles. Uh, and it, it's not just, hey, the private sector can take care of it. It's not just a regulatory policy oriented public sector. There's the nonprofit side involved. All of these sides need to come together to create and address really the affordability concerns and create a more affordable life for people moving forward. Uh, hey, Chris, we have another great uh, comment and question from Miss Maddie um, that we must never forget or repeat the type of displacement that occurred in Brooklyn and throughout other parts of Charlotte and that we must uh, take the bold steps to address this kind of injustice. Um, how will this plan address critical zoning issues and challenges, especially in regards to our equity and inc inclusivity goals? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a, a great comment because uh, something on the surface uh, that you can point to, such as the policies of urban renewal, is very tangible. Um, something where you've seen growth in this community over the last decade that has resulted in displacement and gentrification uh, is a little less 
tangible right away. It's incremental and, you know, a neighborhood changes, then suddenly, wow, you turn around and it's not affordable anymore. The people who built this community can't afford to live here anymore. So um, in this, first of all, we are very aware of that. And it's, it's a critical, critical thing. And um, again, it's, it's not an easy thing. It's related to the last point, but um, building in specific strategies of anti-displacement, of uh, affordability for an equity building of people in the community. You know, um, if you participated, uh, I believe it was last fall in the, um, in the forum that we had, we had uh, for All In 2040, this planning process, we had developer um, Albus from uh, Denver, who he is an African-American developer who is working specifically to go in and build uh, in places where people who are in those communities, in fact, there's a Five Points in Denver, that's the traditional African-American neighborhood, are participating in that equity growth and change where there is the vital need for housing. But that new mixed use development has partners who are of the community. It's not capital from far away. Uh, so, you know, those sorts of strategies, concerted efforts, working with the philanthropic organizations, working with the major capital funders in the community um, are all part of the strategies, but it's, it's, um, critically important. We have the opportunity to get this right. I was um, speaking earlier with um, so, uh, someone about this project where, you know, the Seattle's and the San Francisco's of the world, they're, they missed it. They missed the boat. Those are, let's, let's call it for what it is. Those are playgrounds for, you know, young, white, rich people in many ways, because, and those were very diverse cities. And now those people have been displaced because of those growth pressures that happen so quickly and the, and the rise in prices. And so we're seeing that in Charlotte, but fortunately we're at a point where we can, we can get ahead of it and grab a hold of it so that we can create more equitable opportunities uh, across the board. Great. And uh, Chris, one more follow-up question. Um, to what degree um, and how can we ensure the preservation of historic buildings uh, with through this plan? Yeah, that's that's a, a great question. Um, and, and we know lots of historic buildings have been torn down uh, over time. Uh, importantly, there, there are a couple aspects. One is we can certainly work uh, from the policy and regulatory side to uh, to um, look at further historic standards and preservation and, and identification of you know, those, those assets. I think equally important is, and this is something that's really been a, a boon in the, in the last 10 years of, of urban growth and change across the country, is that historic buildings and assets or, or historic buildings, it's kind of changed to seeing those as assets rather than something to tear down, but rather, uh, something to redevelop and rehabilitate and bring to new life. And a lot of the, uh, you know, neighborhoods that we've seen, both in Charlotte and around the country, there's been value in saying, wait a second, I would rather uh, be in this cool old brick building that has history and culture to it, that centers this neighborhood, rather than in something that is on the urban periphery and a strip center um, that is brand new. Uh, or in something that was, you know, torn down here, and, and we did something prefab. So um, I, I think that there, that this plan can help identify and build strength in each, you know, each of the districts is is totally different, right? We have the West End, we have the North End, we have Belmont, we have Dilworth, we have Elizabeth, we have all these different communities that have their own sense and feel. Wesley Heights is different from, you know, Optimus Park, and and really helping to um, build in, uh, you know, preservation strategies that see that the equity and assets there um, is, is critical. So we're taking a, a deep look at that. Uh, all right, just checking the time here. We have, uh, we're doing pretty well on time. We wanna make sure we uh, do a few more minutes here, I think of um, more comments and questions. 
So I, I have a good one to ask, and uh, we're hearing, we're seeing some of these in the comments as well, but um, you, you started off talking about how much Center City has grown in the past decade, but we also know historically this growth hasn't been equivalent throughout the city, and we sort of touched on it previously, but um, specifically how is this plan going to address bridging to some of those communities? I think specifically about the North End and the West End and bringing in some of those big moves and big ideas and even incorporate some of the basic necessities that we'll need to have a vibrant, vibrant neighborhoods throughout Center City. How is this plan really addressing continuing that bridge into some of those historically disinvestment areas of town? Yeah, it's a, a great question, Charles. And uh, and there's some slides coming up that specifically address that. Um, the, the word from, or the phrase from the beginning in our first steering committee meeting, it was said, we need to invest, I think it was even over invest in under invested communities. And we need to do it in the right way. And so there are some big moves, some infrastructure moves, some addressing of the 277 loop, some smaller moves that we'll take a look at uh, uh, momentarily here with respect to how do we build more of those near-term community amenities that people need in day-to-day -day life in neighborhoods. So I think there are incremental changes and, and, and larger moves. Um, but again, uh, I think seeing the power in this mosaic of districts and, and break, further breaking down that barrier of the loop around that's uptown, that's for a certain type of people, that's the big skyline. No, no, we are all center city and everybody should be able to participate and, and places that need the investment should get that investment and we should maximize that. We'll go through and we'll, I'll show in just a minute here, the, the gold line and streetcar investment in the West End. Well, we need to make sure that's done right. What does that bring? We need to leverage those public dollars that have gone in there for benefit of that surrounding community. Um, Chris, it looks like there's um, a little bit of confusion about the boundaries of the plan. Can you describe a little bit more about what those boundaries are? Absolutely. And uh, I think we showed a map early on uh, that, that was intentionally uh, a, a spectrum. It's a gradient. So there is no hard line at this road or that road or that creek around the plan area. The, the plan is um, a, a spectrum or gradient outward from center city. So uh, uptown is at the core of the plan area. But then if you go uh, essentially two miles out from the, the crossing of Trade and Tryon and, and you draw a, you know, a concentric circles in that spectrum, that's what we're, we're looking at. So some of the neighborhoods I, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, they're all um, included within that. And we've reached out and worked with uh, neighborhood associations and clergy and uh, you know, restaurateurs and uh, people from all advocates, bike advocates, all walks of life in each of those neighborhoods to help define and shape further the, the center city. So that, that's the, the study area, if you will. Maybe one or two more questions here. Sure, yeah, Chris. So uh, we've heard it said before that you know every child is born with talent, regardless of race, income, gender. How does this plan really help facilitate equitable growth for that talent to be, whether it's in new arts or cultural facilities, um, music school, uh, just kind of across the board? How is that uh, that thread woven into the overall plan? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point and one that we're taking a strong look at. Um, I think, it, you know, as we look back at the history of center city planning, there have been big moves. You know, the Blumenthal, the Harvey Gantt Museum, uh, you know, et, et cetera. There have been these big moves in facilities, which are incredibly important. And as a, as a community, as a world-class city, we'll continue to evolve and, and look at uh, facilities that um, really speak, you know, to a, a broad audience and a, a premier level. At the same time, uh, and, and each of those facilities do this also, working programmatically with youth, up and opening up those, those pathways. You know, I did mention earlier about Second Ward High School and the pipeline of, of talent development for future careers and growth. 
you know, but I, I neglected to mention, this is about, at the very core, as we said, it's about people. This is about human growth. Part of growth is in developing your career, your job or your financial future and stability for your family. It's also about things such as music and art and being able to tap into and feeling like, hey, the center city environment has something for me. You know, uh, not having this sense of, oh, well, that's for people who want to go to, you know, the big performance at the Blumenthal. Uh, it, it's, it's not for me here. No, no, no. We, we, we as um, a community and the strategies and the programs being put forth in here, as well as new facilities projects, I, I think it's critically important. I think we can bring that out a little more um, because we are talking about the whole person here from birth to death, different stages of life, different focus and areas of life, and the, and the different qualities we each have. You know, I'm a professional, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I am a drummer, you know, I do different things. We all have those aspects to us, and Center City should be a place where everybody can live that, that healthy life. Um, another question, uh, given all of this planning, how will ideas from this plan be made a reality um, through uh, regulation, through either through the city's UDO uh, uh, zoning ordinance or other methods? Yeah, great question. So I do want to emphasize that this plan is a partnership, uh, you know, and I believe it was stated at the beginning, uh, between the County of Mecklenburg, the City of Charlotte and Center City Partners, each of them are co-funders into this, as well as the multiple, multiple different partners, agencies, uh, individuals who, who are you know, a part of this whole effort, um, nonprofits, et cetera. And so it's going to take partnership on all fronts. This is not a magic wand of, okay, we do this plan and then the city makes a bunch of regulatory changes and then it all happens. Um, no, there will be certain uh, regulatory and, and um, you know, zoning code recommendations uh, that in order to uh, facilitate mixed use in a certain area, the change we wanna see, changes to the streetscape environment so that we are you know, not planning for cars, cars, cars everywhere, which Charlotte and every other city across the country did for decades, but now we've been moving into this era and working with the city and, and, and leaders there in transportation to, to create more of a multimodal environment. So it is, um, there will be, uh, you know, I, as a part of this plan, as an appendix, there's gonna be a very rich matrix of uh, action, responsibility, lead responsibility, timeline, funding sources, mechanisms. So the specifics, of how to go in that direction will, uh, will certainly be a, a part of the plan effort. I, I do wanna move on to uh, the next part of the presentation. Uh, Charles and Mark, Maria, anything I, you know, I might've missed, I wanna underscore the partnership aspect here. Charles, Mark, Maria, and many others have been a part of uh, all of these ideas and planning. Anything I might've missed or that you would add to my answers there? I, I can't no, I think, any, but I appreciate everybody adding their comments. And there's a few that we know we're going to have for uh, the second break, but uh, I can't think of anything else right now. Yeah, I think we're good. All right. Yeah. Great. Well, why don't we then move on? I'm going to minimize the gallery view. And uh, give me just one second here. There we go. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll keep rolling. All right. The first of the second three vision elements is resilient. And a lot of the questions really started to, to move in this direction. Creating a resilient place where we can deal with the next pandemic curveball, where we can work together to ensure that we are not you know, one paycheck away from falling off the grid, that we are together as a community. And a big part of this is creating complete neighborhoods with amenities, services, and affordable and workforce housing. This is not a, 
oh, that would be great as a planner, or let's figure out how to do this in the code. This is a bigger deal. This is an economic and social imperative, absolutely at the core of this plan. And so what does that mean when we look at essential neighborhood goods, services, and amenities? And I mentioned some of this before. There are not every community, in fact, many don't have uh, access to basic services such as health clinics, banks, pharmacies, even the post office, ATMs, um, you know, quick and easy opportunity. I don't own a car. I need to be able to walk or bike or get quickly on transit to my job or to get to, uh, you know, healthcare service. Many food deserts in the community where the, uh, there is not a local market with healthy foods and affordable foods. Very, 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 very important. And then, of course, we've talked about housing and the ability to stay in place and be able to be in different types of housing as your needs grow, maybe as a young single person, to uh, maybe being a couple and having a family, then being empty nesters, whatever it might be. Uh, we want to have neighborhoods that afford all of those stages of life. And then we mentioned previously, restoring and expanding the tree canopy is a big part of this. We cannot talk about a resilient community, about a healthy community without having um, a, a real hard look and discussion about homelessness. And this is, a, this is uh, one where I would say the Seattle's, San Francisco's, New York's, other places, Los Angeles, they, they have not gotten out in front of this. And it's, it's uh, really um, just a societal uh, breakdown in, in how people are living in many of those cities. And we know that this is a growing concern. We know uh, the encampment on uh, North Tryon Street and, and you know, more things happening in the community. Now is the time to build these coalitions, to work in a coordinated manner to get out in front of this. And it's very important to the center city plan. One component of that, of that is to build uh, permanent supportive housing with, uh, with case management and a range of services, knowing that uh, each person is unique and individual as to why they might be in the situation that they're in. And we need to make sure that those services are coupled with housing. It's not just a roof over the head. It's so much deeper. So many people have been doing good work in the community and the faith-based community and the city, et cetera. But we need to bring this about in a coordinated effort. And now is the time to get ahead of it. Also uh, important to a resilient city is uh, ensuring affordable commercial and studio spaces, other uh, types of uh, spaces for businesses, nonprofit organizations, being able to make sure that those small businesses and enterprises can grow and, and not be squeezed out in, uh, in the coming years as growth continues to occur. So North End neighborhoods, that's a big focus of this plan and where a lot of these things about resilient communities come together. You know, we spoke with the community out there and they said, it's hard to cross the street. We don't have uh, great access to transit. Uh, you know, imagine uh, trying to walk along here, right? This is not the most safe or comfortable place. And then you go, you know, what? I'm getting down to the corner store uh, that only has chips and soda versus healthy foods that I need. And when you get past this tree, it's probably an expanse of very little shade on a hot day. It's very difficult. What we would like to see is, and, and building in here is something like more like this. So here we are looking west toward Graham on Dalton Avenue. And you see here the existing condition and the future condition of new housing uh, or, or um, you know, uh, entrepreneurial space that can come in. Uh, adaptive reuse, as we talked about, market spaces, uh, you know, having transit with real-time data, nice shelters, uh, a mailbox. I mean, people said to us, we don't have mailboxes in our neighborhood. That is, should be a basic right. And we should be able to be on a street where it's not just about the automobile, but I can safely feel like I can safely ride my bike and get to where I wanna go. So there's more planning that needs to be done here in the North End. We need to make sure that this is all interconnected with the surroundings um, in Greater Center City, open spaces, active 
uh, transportation, on, on trails. I can get quickly in, not just on this street, but on other trail systems if I need to get into the uptown core or to adjacent neighborhoods. Uh, this was brought up earlier, uh, but West Trade and the West End and Beatty's Ford Road, a, a critical, critical area that's been on the radar for a long time. And right now, and just to orient everybody, we're, we're on the, in the West End looking northwest. Here's Johnson C. Smith. Here's five points. This is um, where the gold line has come in. This is an older uh, image right here. And then you see uh, the cloverleaf interchange from I-77. But there are um, very real concerns here about, well, you put this infrastructure investment of the streetcar out here. What does that do for me? Does that squeeze me out? Does that um, create a different environment? Does that impinge upon the, um, the historic African-American legacy in this uh, very important neighborhood? And so uh, we've been working with uh, the uh, Five Points Forward plan, which is, um, in fact, Neighboring Concepts, one of our consultants on the team is leading that effort, which has been working with the entire community out here to craft specific recommendations and actions related to change in this area. And it's along these lines that if we can create a center um, with the right types of development and the right sort of density that can uh, be focused on displacement mitigation for existing residents and have them participate in the equity growth of the investments that would be coming along the way. That is the, the set of strategies being brought forth in the Five Points Forward Plan. Uh, the West End as a destination for African-American arts, culture, and history. Again, this is just a concept. This just starts to show how this area may change and grow, and that in doing so, uh, we can create an urban street grid, canopy, a sense of place and destination to, again, uh, uh, support and celebrate uh, the African American history in the neighborhood. And then you see here uh, this re potential reconfiguration here, the interchange and working with NC DOT, um, where, you know, instead of for the car and being able to, um, you know, access the freeway differently, we can go ahead and use that space for development that um, can be of benefit for the community. Affordable housing, other components would all be a part of this. Um, the West Trade Government District, here's another area, another focus area here that you see along uh, the gold line. And today we have an environment that uh, here in the, you know, the nexus of the second ward and the first ward here, where there are a lot of big government buildings. There's lots of those blank walls and spaces where it's not necessarily uh, uh, great to walk, nor are there services and amenities for me. Uh, again, conceptually, what might we start to see? Well, we do think that this is a, a, a growth opportunity here where we can fill in some of these parking lots, these missing uh, teeth in the fabric and create a high quality pedestrian experience and have more uh, affordable and workforce housing, uh, have amenities on the ground floor so that we have uh, cafes, we have cleaners, we have delis, we have other things uh, that are all important to create a thriving neighborhood. Again, this is a concept. We want to hear your thoughts and ideas about is this an opportunity to create better change here along uh, East Trade and in the government district. And ultimately, the, the back side of this on the right hand side, uh, going out toward uh, Elizabeth and uh, CCPC and beyond. Um, Cedar Yards and the Pipe and Foundry. This area on the uh, southwest part of Uptown, uh, we know that there's been some moves and changes uh, with the ownership there, with the Pipe and Foundry services going uh, outside the city. And, and there's new development being pondered by that large ownership entity. We wanna make sure that that new development works for Center City uh, in Uptown as well as the surrounding areas. So, we are working with them and putting forth in this plan the idea that this needs to be a complete mixed use neighborhood. We talked about that historic architecture and character preservation. That is, there are uh, some really neat buildings in there that we wanna make sure are not just torn down for no reason, but can be a part of that patina to and legacy to create a new district. 
uh, a big idea around this too is to ensure that this is not, um, you know, the rail line is there. We have the 277 loop dividing with the Mint District. We want to make sure that there are connections heading up the gateway, heading to the current Bank of America site. Maybe there's an idea to do something uh, like an elevated walkway, like the High Line in New York, that could go over and really connect and make sure that this district is not an island. No district should be an island in Center City. Rather, it should all connect and support one another. Sustainability is a big uh, um, part of people's input over the last uh, year, year and a half. And people are very concerned about climate change. Uh, they're concerned about energy use, about water use, about being good stewards of the planet. And as we know, um, the city's strategic energy action plan is underway. This plan will have strategies that specifically support that uh, low carbon urban core uh, vision uh, through a variety of different means in the built form and, and the, the, the public realm, the, the greater uh, green environment around. All of those things are, a support, are supported here in this project. Importantly, one of the things we can do strongly with respect to sustainability is making big, bold moves on mobility. The automobile, transit use, et cetera, or transportation rather, accounts for uh, anywhere from 30 to 40% of uh, carbon emissions into the atmosphere. The more people we can get biking, walking, on trains, the better for the planet. And we have made those big moves on mobility. Uh, and a lot, the this is the envy of many places to wish we had, or they wish they had a blue line, a gold line, and then this is the silver line that is still on the drawing boards, but uh, is a, a strong possibility. This is uh, a draft alignment. They're thinking through, there are some different alternatives, but likely it would go along this path, this dashed purple line. Importantly though, as we look at uh, this sustainable opportunity, and remember sustainability is not just about environment. Sustainability is about how are we um, economically sustainable and supporting ourselves in the future? How are we socially sustainable? And making sure that uh, we are leveraging this infrastructure. Each of these stations becomes a walk shed and a place where, you know, maybe I don't have to spend money on a car or another car in the family. I can live in that apartment and work, or I'm sorry, walk to the station or bike to the station and work. And that decreases my cost and it allows me to save up to buy a home or invest in other ways. It's a big part of economic sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. Importantly, right along these lines though, I think it's fair to say that uh, in these blue bubbles that you see here, there's been tremendous growth that can be linked to uh, that public infrastructure improvement of the blue line. However, um, in those blue bubbles, I don't think it's been to the benefit of everyone. I think that uh, you know, a, a lot of the development that's occurred has been kind of for one uh, demographic and, 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 you know, one set of income levels. We have opportunity here, very uh, near term, putting forth in policy, putting forth in programs and projects, something that we would call ETOD, equitable trans-oriented development, where we're leveraging that public infrastructure investment, prioritizing housing and mixed-use projects, uh, on maybe city-owned land to build in greater levels of, of affordable components, making sure that we're including uh, in these areas uh, accessibility to transit stations, easy for people, as well as inclusion of public space and community amenities, really important. And perhaps one of the biggest ideas, if you will, coming out of this plan relates to equitable transit development, as well as that connectivity question to the North End, uh, and many other things is the, um, is the uh, uh, crossing of the silver line and the blue line. So this would be a new crossing right here that we believe has more opportunity than just a platform where one train is below the other. We think this could be a place of a, almost a central station type feel, a place with mixed use development with plazas and community amenities and really the opportunity to look at this whole section of Uptown, 
which right now is largely parking lots. There's new, some new development that's come in here, but the idea that as we look and um, you can see my cursor, here's the blue line. The silver line will likely come in uh, something along the 11th street alignment here. And if we look at a potential future, again, this is just concept to get our ideas and thoughts going. Well, there's opportunity for uh, new mixed use development offices for the, the employment of the future, a mix of income levels for housing, public open spaces here. And you see here what might be, you know, kind of that um, investment here that could take place with a, a greater transit station type environment. One that you see in, in major cities, one that you see in places like Europe. Again, uh, also building toward this idea to connect further north and overcome this barrier. There are ideas that continue to circulate that we're looking at about do we uh, you know, connect further underneath? Do we bury parts of the I-277? Do we bring it to grade to make sure we can get people to safely walk across and connect further north um, to uh, investment opportunities in the North End. All of this is not just these big moves. It relates to um, these smaller moves, crosswalks, basic crosswalks in places as we've discussed, or new um, you know, cycle tracks that you see here on the left. And we're connecting with, this plan really is integrative of so many different planning um, projects and, and initiatives. Uh, the Uptown Cycle Link has identified uh, many connections and corridors so that people don't feel compelled to get in a single family car all the time, but instead can go via other means. Importantly, this is not just about, uh, you know, getting in a uh, transit uh, lane or a, um, a bicycle lane somewhere, but rethinking our streets. I think one of the things that's been fantastic about or a great opportunity from the, the COVID era has been, hey, we need this public realm to be together. We've, we've had to do it with masks on and socially distant, but we've closed down streets. We've created these shared streets in Charlotte and around the country. What if we can extend that and think of our streets in ways that can still allow automobiles to come through, but instead create places for play, for art, for interaction, and these other modes that can be in the community and again, create that livability uh, and amenities for everyone. We're making a lot of strides along these lines uh, with respect to electrification of transit, the idea that we can create more uh, state-of-the-art bus transit, whether it's through bus rapid transit or uh, spaces and places with real-time data and a transit shelter that's fun like this, or is a, a true shelter and not somewhere where you're getting pelted by rain because uh, you know it didn't adequately provide safe space, lighting, comfort. Uh, so all of those things are critical. Finally, and then I'll wrap up here, and we want to make sure we get to lots more comments, is the word loved. And I've, I've said this a few times over the last couple of days, but uh, this is not a word in our planning work that we uh, do across the country. It's not a word that get, makes it into a lot of, of plans, and, but we heard it early on and in many ways that people said, I love this community. I really love Charlotte and I think it has so much potential, but we've got to bring it out more. We need to elevate the love. We need to wear it on our sleeve. We need to have places that support and cultivate our love for Center City Charlotte. So it's a it's a, a big idea that um, we want to continue to foster. One of those things is cultivating Center City as an international destination. Um, you know, we've, again, going back to, we've heard people say, you know, why can't we be where somebody comes from across the world where they say, oh yeah, I'm going to the United States, I'm visiting New York, I'm visiting Chicago, and I'm visiting Charlotte. Because I've heard that Charlotte has these world-class venues, but it's also so livable. And it's such a great place to interact with uh, with all the people there. And it's surprising. And there are things going on in the public open spaces that, and the events and festivals, all kinds of things um, we have heard. And we want to build that in to a loved center city. Um, this has to do certainly with improving existing parks and open spaces in the programming. And lots of this 
can be free and should be free and affordable. Uh, and again, relating to that, that um, notion of equity, you should not have to uh, you know, have a lot of money or be of a certain class to participate in this love and wear it on your, your sleeve, particularly in Uptown. We want everybody to be able to participate. And we also think there's opportunity for a diversity of new spaces that we want to continue to build. And sometimes those are as easy as small dog parks and pocket parks. I love this city because my neighborhood has this sort of amenity right next to me. Um, it might be a big Romare Bearden Park where you live right there, or it might be your small, really great space uh, in Optimus Park. All of those things should be a part of um, you know, this love for the community. And we need to make sure it's year round. We need to make sure it's responsive to the pandemic now, as well as being flexible uh, in the future for whatever we may face. Finally, and I appreciate your patience. It's a lot of stuff, but it's a lot of ideas that the community has, has brought forth. Um, the South End uh, gateway here. So we talked about the, the breaking down this barrier of the, of the I-277 on the North End. But you know, a lot has happened in the south end and in the center core here, while we still have the loop barrier here. And this is a bigger idea, and, and it may now be time for this. This was actually an idea that was brought forth for the 2020 plan originally. But this sense of this big expanse here, is this the best way to use this space? And, um, but, but now, across the country, many communities over the last decade have said, you know what, we're gonna cap our freeway for you know, kind of a block or two so that we can connect neighborhoods and districts. And we work with the state DOT, we work with other funders and bring together a big idea that can promote the community coming together, create a world-class destination in space. Uh, you know, they did this in, uh, in Dallas with Clyde Warren Park. They of course did this with the Big Dig and the Rose Candy Greenway up in Boston but a way to then stimulate this environment for everybody to increase development opportunities as the uptown core has changed. And you see here, you know, the new buildings that have come along in the last decade that have brought us to the South. What if we can create a freeway cap park like this that then extends uh, as a gateway to the South end and vice versa, going from this opportunity to this opportunity. Lots more to go there, but I think it's an idea that can really start to take uh, hold in this coming period for planning. So um, there's a lot of ideas in this. There's a lot that we didn't cover for sake of time, uh, but uh, hopefully this keeps your juices flowing here and let's continue the conversation. And I'll invite uh, Charles and Maria and Mark to come back here. Great, thanks, Chris. And <clears throat> I know we're a little over time, so we're gonna grab three questions from the chat here and get to those. And moving forward, you know, we'd love to answer all of your questions and we spent a little bit longer in that first Q&A period. So we wanna be respectful for your time and we'll make sure to respond to all of those queries and questions from Facebook, from Q&A portion, from the chat and get those posted on the website coming out of this. But I'm gonna hand it over to Charles to ask the first question from the, from the chat. Perfect, thanks. Uh, so, so Chris, we just touched on it. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the bigger projects we talked about, you know, namely the idea of, you know, the freeway cap and the silver line and blue line development, um, even the idea of, of Queens Park. So um, can we talk about how, you know, we can use those to, to really leverage, you know, public community resources around these big ideas, particularly um, in African American communities and minority groups, um, and and demographics that typically don't get access to some of these resources. Yeah, and we, you know, we've touched upon it to a certain degree in some of the presentation materials here. Um, I, I think it 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 definitely involves, you know, um, micro concerted strategies that are. Uh, that are um, 
you know, place based that may be different in uh, a West End versus a North End versus a, um, you know, a Noda or whatever it, it might be. And, and so looking very specifically at what are the vacant lots, what are, what's the connectivity from the neighborhood to that Blue Line Station or, or uh, Gold Line Station. I think more importantly, at a, at a, or as importantly, it also is this higher level. And I think using, and that's the power of a center city plan document, using this as uh, an opportunity to Whoa, whoa, whoa. We have our center city plan that everybody has bought into. We are all working together to not let gentrification forces overtake these places. We are all working together to ensure and use as a sieve. Okay, we're, we got new federal infrastructure dollars. Maybe there's a big um, you know, stimulus that comes in the Biden administration. I don't know. But, you know, we're not just then going along with, oh, where might we, you know, put this? It's, what does the center city plan say? What does the comprehensive plan say? And then what does the center city plan say to direct that investment? And then how are we then ensuring that investment uh, raises up the communities that you described? I think that's the power of this plan where, where we can always go back and say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. That's not, the, the center city plan is giving us direction. That we took that time during that tumultuous uh, 2020 and really brought it together for what our vision is. And we have to implement that. It's incumbent upon all of us. And I mean all of us as civic leaders, as elected officials, appointed officials, commissioners, business leaders, small business owners, advocates, neighborhoods, one person on the street. I mean, we all can own and should own this plan and hold ourselves to those values that are expressed. That's great, that's great, Chris, thanks. Um, we've received actually a lot of questions now also about uh, Tryon and other streets kind of throughout. Um, does this plan look to allocate more space for bikes and peds kind of throughout uh, the center city area? And is that including connections to, you mentioned a really exciting project potentially at the silver and blue line crossing. What does that connectivity look like? Is it micro shuttles or are there other innovations? and? I guess to tag on to that last bit, you know, how does that relate to parking? Are there creative parking solutions that we can tie into that? Yeah, and I would, I would invite you, Mark, as one of the experts on our team to maybe uh, uh, augment anything I say here. Um, well, I, I think it's one, you saw the up, Uptown Link, a cycle link project, it's implementing that plan. A lot of great analysis has gone into, well, where can we make, where are the missing segments? Where can we make uh, critical connections. What does that take? Is it, you know, using up certain right away? Do we need to find some other way to get around? Um, and, and you know, how do we get from the Little Sugar Creek Greenway in a safe way uh, across the Uptown Core or whatever it might be? So uh, definitely, uh, there's this plan supports that implementation. I think uh, also uh, the the ability to. And I, I showed some images there of, of thinking of streets transformed. You know, uh, the, 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 the current changes that we're seeing in uh, patterns of commute, of, uh, you know, working from home, and maybe in the future, more of us are, you know, we're still gonna be working in offices, but maybe not as much, maybe it's not every day. And that starts to shift on, you know, what are the parking needs per se, or, does every street that we have need to operate in its current condition? Can we start to prioritize certain ones more with true transformation, with a grid in um, you know, districts that, hey, a car can come through here, but you are second fiddle now to people on bikes, people on scooters, people walking. So that's, that's one component, I think. Programmatically, uh, you know, there are further things we can do with employment to, um, and, and, you know, connect with uh, employers being able to provide passes for you know, bus system with cats and, and, um, and, uh, and, and light rail. Those are called transportation demand management strategies, realizing that it's not all about the, the infrastructure. It's also about, uh, you know, how we have people get, you know, 
be able to uh, participate through a program, make it easy for them, make that connection, make that connection, um, you know, well lit and safe. Oftentimes, hey, yeah, I'd like to get on there, but boy, waiting at the bus stop is just a grind. It's not worth it to me. Making those investments, I think is critical. And I think being part of the question is being future oriented. There are new mobility uh, things that will be coming down the pike that we're not sure, you know, uh, how quickly and how much they will impact. So autonomous vehicle shuttles and, and connections or autonomous transportation with, with cars. Um, being able to be, as I said at the beginning, nimble and flexible to bring into the mix a, a plethora of transportation ideas. The important thing being this plan is about multimodal connectivity and accessibility. This is not about let's plan for cars, let's plan for all the parking we can, and then figure out the other stuff where it supports or squeezes in. It's actually, it's, it's about having a much more balanced look and a 21st century transit system that supports all charlatans. Um, Chris, one last question that we wanted to bring up in here um, was about uh, playgrounds and facilities for kids specifically in Uptown. Um, how will this plan address parks, open spaces, and um, addressing the needs of all of uh, children and people of all ages and abilities? Yeah, that's uh, I, I love that question. And at the core, uh, I, I think it, you know one of the first things out of the pandemic people strived for or just understood, wow, I need, I need to get outside. I need to breathe fresh air. I need to recreate. I need to feel like you know, I can get outside my house. It, it just exposed how critical th those elements are for uh, creating a truly livable neighborhood in a livable place. So um, that, that's very much a part of this plan. You know, there were some of the bigger moves that were done in the 2020 plan where Romare Bearden Park came into place, First Ward Park came into place. Uh, there is certainly a bigger idea people may have heard about, the Friends of Queens Park, where the idea about in the North End, um, uh, working with the railroad to uh, you know, maybe change some of their land and, and rail lines in there and create a, a, a truly big space and central park. Uh, it's a big idea, potentially, you know, that could come about in the future. And, and we don't want to minimize any of those moves I, I just mentioned. At the same time, I think this plan is, is focused on a lot of the, the more textural moves, the, the, the smaller moves. The, you know, we showed the, the north end along Dalton there. The ability to, to, to bring in those amenities, services, a market, but then also marry that with a space that we're talking about, a pocket park, a, a, a ha an area for habitat. Uh, a place where children can walk down the street and learn about the the natural world by being able to actually play with bugs and and be in a in a, a setting uh, where that that sort of natural activity occurs in that park uh, or adjacent trail land. So those are key things that we're going to continue to to weave, and it's a it's it's important that each neighborhood has those assets because nobody should have to go, I live in this neighborhood, but for me to take my child to learn about some of that stuff or to recreate or to get some breathing room or to have a picnic or to meet my friend, I have to travel across town or across uh, neighborhoods to have that? No, no, no. We need all those in each of those spaces and they don't have to be a Romare Bearden Park, right? They can be right-sized and should be right-sized for that community. The community gets to own it and feel a part of its identity. And then we need to connect those together. So you can go from neighborhood to neighborhood uh, along trail systems, bike, et cetera. All right, any other uh, things you all want to uh, bring forth? Uh, as far as, and, and I do want to emphasize, I think Maria may have, or, or Charles may have mentioned this earlier, that um, the, the, the comments, the questions, we're not able to get to everything today, but we're getting a really good list together. This is going to be uh, uh, on uh, YouTube. Later on, we're going to get comments from there. 
this is the draft plan idea period. We want to make sure if your if your spouse, your friend, uh, whomever couldn't attend today, uh, go to allin2040.com, and you will be able to uh, uh, have a link that accesses you to this Zoom and to uh, this presentation. I do have one more slide here, if I can pull it up, that we can talk about the next steps then. Let's see here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Whoops. There we go. So um, speaking of those next steps, right now, November, December, uh, <clears throat> we're gathering this input to help shape the draft plan. And again, um, we appreciate you all taking the time today. Please tell others about this process and, and go to allin2040.com to make sure that you can sign up, get more postings on this, as well as uh, contribute your, your comments and feedback. Uh, we will be crafting the draft plan in the first quarter of 2021, uh, which means that everything you've seen here today, as well as the additional detail, ideas, um, critiques that we're getting from this, as well as uh, other sessions, will be folded into the specifics of a, of a draft plan document and some of the materials I, I uh, talked about previously and, and the, that kind of specific action planning, if you will. And then we will begin uh, the plan adoption process in uh, March 2021. So uh, that will be um, going forth to the county commission for uh, their acceptance of the project, approval by the city council, as well as the board of Charlotte Center City Partners. And, and really, um, you know, the implementation is happening now. We're not waiting until then. There are lots of great ideas. Lots of great things we've discussed with community members um, to, to support this plan and support the vision for the future. So uh, we look forward to you all staying in touch. Please stay tuned. And uh, I really want to thank, again, everybody, which I, I won't be able to name everybody, uh, but who is involved in uh, making these plan materials and making this, uh, this plan process a, a, a great great uh, experience today and, and throughout the preceding months. I, in particular, I wanna thank Charles, Mark, and Maria for uh, helping me out here today. And uh, we look forward to the next time we can connect. Thank you so much for your time. Take care, everyone.